Hello, everyone, and welcome to Autism Stories. I'm your host, Doug Bletcher, the founder of Autism Personal Coach. In the last year or so, something that I have really wanted to learn more about is supporting autistic people in crisis because there are way too many autistic people in this state or at a great risk to be in crisis. It's frustrating that there is such limited information about this available, and that's why I'm thrilled to have Lisa Morgan, a trauma-informed specialist, join us today. I will talk with Lisa about identifying faster when autistic people may be entering a crisis state, and if they do enter this state, what are the best strategies in supporting them? We hope you enjoyed today's conversation. Lisa, thanks so much for joining us today. Thank you. It's good to be here. I wanted to start out by learning where does your story in the autistic community begin? Well, I was formally diagnosed as autistic in July of 2010, and I also that year began teaching at a small private school with many autistic students from 2010 to 2016. I absolutely, absolutely loved working at that school with those students and found I was able to really understand and connect with my autistic students. And that was the first time I'd say I really felt part of a community of autistic people. And my connection with autistic adults and with books and has continued with different writing projects. So after getting my diagnosis, I started searching the internet to see where I could connect with other autistic adults. And I found an author who was looking for submissions to a book that was being written by autistic people. And so my very first interaction was with adults was contributing to that book uh, called Been There, Done That, Try This. And that's when I met other autistic adults for the very first time. And then uh, in 2016, after release of my book, uh, my first book, I was invited to write for the online Spectrum Woman magazine by editor Barb Cook. And I, I was just taking a walk one day and got this message from Barb and inviting me to uh, interview for my book uh, at the magazine. And from there I met a lot of amazing women. I became close friends with some of them, and I've been writing for the magazine ever since. I've become involved with the autism community more and more as an advocate for crisis supports and suicide prevention. Now, I recently had the privilege to attend a webinar in which you presented on crisis supports and considerations about warning signs of suicide for the autism community. And I left that webinar thinking that I wanted to talk with you about this critical information. Now, in terms of these warning signs, are there certain signs that are different for autistic people as compared to non-autistics? So the warning signs for the general public are not completely different, but do, definitely do require considerations for autistic people. So, for example, withdrawing is listed as a warning sign but it's also a coping mechanism for autistic people. So withdrawing to spend time alone is a meaningful way for autistic people to practice self-care. And there can be some confusion if withdrawing to take care of oneself is mistaken as a warning sign for suicide. So what I advocate is that considerations must be taken when assessing autistic people for suicide. Another example is anxiety, agitation, and issues with sleep. That's another warning sign for the general population, but all of these warning signs can be characteristics of autism. So what is needed is for professionals to really listen and understand what's happening in the lives of autistic people. They need to understand autism so they can have a good, good idea of what might be a warning sign of suicide and what might simply be characteristics of autism. And what would, what would some of the typical warning signs of suicide look like for autistic people? Well, besides the regular warning signs uh, for the general public, they still do uh, go, still pertain to autistic people. But I believe uh, one of them to be anxiety, impulsiveness, and alexithymia together, which alexithymia is the inability to identify and verbalize emotions. And together, they are warning signs for autistic people. There have been no studies to show the relationship between these, these three volatile states, but in the moment when our emotions are huge, and an autistic person is struggling, anxiety and impulsiveness together with alexithymia can be a dangerous combination. 
but also there was a study done on thwarted belongingness, uh, thwarted belonging and perceived burdensomeness, and there, there are possible risk factors which can also become warning signs if a traumatic experience results from these risk factors. So in the instance of a crisis based on any of these risk factors, the typical warning signs should be used with characteristics of autistic people taken into consideration. So what, what is important is for professionals to truly understand autism, how it presents, what autistic people struggle with, how to communicate with autistic people, and to really listen to what they're saying. I would specify listening to understand, not listening to reply. And there are so many professionals who listen to simply reply, but listening to understand requires an open mind, requires cultural understanding, and presumed confidence. When autistic people are in crisis, I've heard them asked, how are you feeling, or something to that effect. However, for many people, I think that might be a really difficult question because they may struggle, especially in that state, to identify or verbalize emotions. What would be a better way to approach this situation if you're trying to support an autistic person in that situation? Yes, uh, a vague question like, how are you feeling, is difficult to answer, even on a good day. There are so many possibilities. My first thought when I'm asked that question is always, how am I feeling about what? I try to narrow it down, but in a crisis situation, it's not helpful at all. A, a much better way to find out how an autistic person is doing while in a crisis is to ask short questions that get straight to the point using as few words as possible. For example, are you okay? That's a question with a yes or no answer. Or what do you need? This, this question can be answered with one word if, if needed. Uh, those are short, easy to answer questions. And yes, you mentioned autistic people may struggle in a crisis with identifying or verbalizing emotions. So if the person in crisis can still not answer those short questions, it's important to be aware they might answer in a different way. So, for example, describing a situation that feels close to what they're feeling. So I, I've used the example of describing an empty, deserted carnival grounds with old, rusty rides, trash blowing around in the wind, half inflated balloons, and silence to help someone understand depression or loneliness. And some autistic people in crisis have no words. And I would encourage people who are helping an autistic person in crisis who suddenly find themselves with no words to, to stick with them until they get their words back if possible. But many times the words will come back after having time to calm down. And then they can express their needs and, and receive some support. Yeah, just being a little bit more patient, I think, can go a long way. Yes. Now... Social communication has been shown to be a big risk factor in autistic people becoming suicidal. One of those risk factors of social communication is something that we've talked about with past guests on Autism Stories, and that is camouflaging or masking. So could masking literally be a matter of life or death for autistic people? It is very harmful. Yes. Um, a study by Cass et al. in 2018 did show that masking or camouflaging to be a risk factor for suicide. I can't say if it's a matter of life or death, but I wouldn't be surprised if a traumatic experience around masking caused an autistic person to become suicidal. The harm to one's self, sense of self can be so devastating to someone who already feels like they don't belong to the society they live in. What, what masking does is show over and over again that an autistic person is only accepted if they mask who they really are as a person. And the reward for masking is acceptance, but not acceptance of who they are. It's acceptance of who society wants them to be. And it's extremely lonely. It's a lonely existence, especially if a brave soul decides to become themselves and is suddenly rejected by the people who have become meaningful them while they're masked. But I think the loss of those relationships can be uh, a matter of life or death to an autistic person. 
Another aspect of social communication is unmet needs. When we are talking about unmet needs, what are the specific areas that we're talking about? Well, first, there, there are studies that have shown unmet needs to be a unique risk factor for suicide in autistic people. And unmet needs can include uh, things like housing, jobs, relationships, community support, access to mental and physical health care, and, and then, of course, being understood, having autistic people understood once they do have access is very important. And then daily living skills. These are all potentially unmet needs for an autistic person. I know one of the unmet needs is something that I'm passionate about, which is supporting autistic people in develop relationships or in developing community. You wrote an article on the challenges of friendship a few years ago, which was fantastic, and talked about social mistakes. How does the idea of the social mistake affect the ability to maintain friendships over the course of time? Ah, yes, the social mistake. <laughs> uh, <laughs> the social mistake, yeah, represents any social miscommunication that can take place in a friendship due to autism. That's what I wanted to show in my article. It could be blatant honesty. It could be literalness. Um, having to cancel plans at the last minute due to high anxiety or any other possible way of being autistic that can strain a relationship. And the article was about an autistic person taking precautions to keep a uh, friendship, knowing that a social mistake is bound to happen due to those uh, social communication difficulties and losing the friendship anyway. The article describes an autistic person asking their friend to let them know if they say something that offends or hurts them because they want to be able to fix it and be able to, you know, fix any misunderstanding that happens. The autistic person uh, in the article is trying to be proactive in preventing ways previous relationships have just suddenly just ended. But the friends aren't completely honest, possibly so feelings don't get hurt, and the relationship suffers from it. And in the article, the autistic person loses friendship after friendship. Kind of like what, I mean, we can experience that in real life, too, while doing everything they can to keep those friendships. But it does take two people to make a successful relationship. And I, I think, actually, if I was to write that article now, I would include more about how communication difficulties come from both sides of the relationship. But without open, honest communication, a relationship is in trouble with any neurology. And since I wrote that article, I have come to understand social communication definitely goes both ways and I'm constantly tripped up by words spoken that don't actually mean what they say and mm -hmm. the social nuances mm -hmm. of non autistic communication that also hinders the effort to, to maintain relationships over time. Well I would definitely be interested in reading a part two of that article. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> now Special interests or passions are things that I would say are essential for autistic people in their lives. How does one's special interest affect their potential risk of suicide? Well, I, I think it actually can help. Uh, there's no studies to confirm this, but I do believe a special interest can help an autistic person in crisis to break out of perseverating on negative thoughts or emotions. So perseveration is the rumination of thoughts, and in a crisis situation, that can be difficult to stop. An autistic person can be highly anxious, and perseverating on whatever they experienced to put them in crisis, like anyone else, uh, it can be difficult to change their perspective, although perseveration can make it much more difficult. I believe finding out what a special interest is for an autistic person and then trying to engage them in a conversation about it can help them to calm down and at least slow down the perseverating, if not stop it. And the conversation should also follow the suggestions about saying as few words as possible, asking direct questions, and using the exact meaning of words and not using any social nuances in, um, in trying to engage them in talking about their special interests. You are the co-chair for the Autism and Suicide Committee through the American Association of Suicideology. 
What's the objective of this committee? The, well, the mission statement of the Autism and Suicide Committee is to help the autism community in all issues of suicide. And the main goal we have is to develop resources in suicide prevention for autistic people. We've developed a crisis toolkit for use in crisis centers, and the toolkit is being used by crisis center workers um, and getting positive feedback. I've also been told that other types of professionals are also using the toolkit to help them identify and then communicate with their autistic clients. So family and friends can use it as well. And it's basically Autism 101 and can help anyone understand autism and autistic people. And right now the committee is working on a resource on warning signs for autistic people. And it will contain the information presented in that webinar that you attended and what I've been talking about here today. That's great. That was uh, very useful information. What's been the specific feedback on terms of the crisis toolkit, how it's helped when, when interacting with autistic people? What I have heard over and over again, and this is from non-autistic people, is thank you, thank you for writing this. Um, they just really, from what I can understand, is they, they really truly want to help and they just don't know how. So what the Crisis Toolkit shows is just basically the characteristics of autism, what autistic people might struggle with. It shows their strengths uh, to also use in a crisis situation. And it, it gives ways, specific ways for crisis center workers and other professionals to help autistic people. And it just, I hear over and over again, they're just so happy to have something that says in black and white what they need to do. And it also gives them, you know, information to understand autistic people better. So they, they've been appreciative about that too. Through my organization, I've seen a large number of autistic people we have coached who are also living with PTSD. That's why I was really excited uh, to hear about your upcoming book you have written on this subject, Living with PTSD on the Autism Spectrum, Insightful Analysis with Practical Applications. What do you hope people take away from reading your book? My hope is that people will take away an understanding of how PTSD is so widespread among autistic people. I hope it becomes a valuable resource for professionals, uh, family, friends, and autistic people themselves in learning about PTSD and autism. There's a particularly difficult way the symptoms of PTSD and the characteristics of autism work together against the person with this uh, code for diagnosis. So there's also hope. So if professionals can understand the particular way PTSD and autism smash up together, there is, there is hope of health and healing. This book has, it has a unique perspective of both professionals' uh, training and experience and also an autistic person's practical living experience. And together with uh, this problem solving with what works, and I shared a lot of my own experiences living with PTSD. Um, this is probably the hardest book I've written yet and took about two years to write it. It tells about my experiences, it tells about how I got through the tough parts. I explain what worked, what didn't work, what might be the best thing to do, what not to do. My co-author and I include uh, what types of relationships and situations can cause PTSD in autistic people, and how it's not necessarily one traumatic experience, but a lifetime of interpersonal traumatic experiences like bullying, and rejection, and masking that happen in all different kinds of relationships. I think it's an incredibly valuable book, and I cannot wait to read it. How can people go about purchasing it? Right now, it is um, available for pre-order on Amazon in the U.S. and Australia and Europe. It's all, it's, and probably on the JKT website as well. Well, Lisa, I really appreciate the conversation. Thanks so much for joining us today. Well, thank you for having me. It's been, it's been really good. Thank you for having me. Thanks to everyone for listening, and thank you to Lisa for the great conversation. 
Check out the podcast description for a link to purchase Lisa's upcoming book, Living with PTSD on the Autism Spectrum, Insightful Analysis with Practical Applications. If you would like to be notified about each week's episode of Autism Stories, we suggest you subscribe on your favorite podcast listening platform. We'd also appreciate if you can give us a positive rating and review as it will help others to learn about autism stories. On next week's episode of Autism Stories, we will talk with Philip Magruder about intersectionality as it relates to the college experience. Talk to you then.